interesting. Oh, it like, just gives you like yeah. Really if I don't if and... I don't have at least a bit of like fat or protein yeah. with my coffee, I'm cactus. Yeah, yeah. I'm smashed. I've never tried that bulletproof coffee. I need to. Uh, I've just been playing around. A friend of mine's all the, into the nutritional mm-hmm. side, so we're just mucking around yeah. and seeing what effect it has on me. Yeah. So yeah, it it, it has a, a, a good effect. Yeah. Um, just makes it more sustained yeah you know so that bulletproof concept is a particular quality of coffee that they ensure isn't moldy that's one of the biggest issues with coffee apparently is a lot of it has this mold okay from the way it's stored so right right um some companies are just doing it consciously in which uh it's not stored for as long and it just it's really susceptible to mold yeah, and there's there's a there's a brand that came out of the state that already has the fat content in it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they've they I don't know if they've mixed the fat with the you know I don't know if it's in the pods or mm. whatever, but it's already put together. So um, yeah, we were talking about that yesterday mm. actually. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, Laird Hamilton has a line of coffees that has the has the fats in right, it. Right, it's okay. great. Okay, well, maybe yeah. that was it. <laughs> Land Superfoods. Yeah. But, Michael, it's great to be with you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> How is Bali life treating you? Well, Bali, Bali life is great. It's very hot this time of yeah. the year. But, it's uh, look, it's, it's, it's a lifestyle that I'd really enjoy. It's, it promotes the, the, the style of living that I, that, I, that I enjoy. Obviously, pretty active, outdoorsy. Um, we've been here for about six years. Um, no, no immediate end to our, to, to living here at this stage. So yeah, it's it's good. It's close to Australia as well. The proximity to home is makes it makes it a bit more comforting. Beautiful. You look incredible. <laughs> I mean, you look the same to when you were like in the peak of your swimming career. Huh? <laughs> Thank you very much. So it's obviously working your lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. Look, I think lifestyle optimization is something that I've, I've actually had to learn a bit about because uh, I think you know we were very focused around swimming for majority of my life and then you know I started having kids running a business and I think I I, I learned the hard way that I was sort of running on empty burning the candle both ends and in the last three years self-care has become a much more of a focus so Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's much definitely easier working. to do here. And your skin is incredible. I want to talk about your skincare company. Like, you're obviously using it and it's working. You have to, absolutely. <laughs> Except great. for my peeling head, actually. I mean. Right. Got to put some more on your head. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Well, good work. I mean, I want to talk a little bit about your career, but mainly about lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, when would you say was the like, peak of your career? Was it the 2000s? Olympics. Look, I think I had a period between late '97 up to the the Sydney Olympics where I was, you know, I was on a really good wave. I uh, had a great kind of flow with my career. I had a really tough learning in '96 when I went to the '96 Olympic Games, ranked number one in the world. Um, probably expected to win the gold in the 200 freestyle. Um, I missed the final that day. And it was a really tough lesson. I was only 18 at that point, and um, I had to make a lot of changes. And I implemented those, and you know the results started coming very quickly. I broke my first world record within 10 months of coming back after the Olympics, and um, and then becoming world champion in the, in four different events in Perth in '98. And that was kind of that was that week in January of '98, kind of you know changed my life completely you know I went from being just an up and coming junior and with potential to being obviously a world record holder and a and a world champion mm. so and then obviously we're very fortunate that we had the Commonwealth Games um, you know we had a bunch of events that were on home soil and that that lead up to Sydney was uh you know, it was, it was fantastic that uplift we got from you know, from the public, from from every circle. It must have been incredible. <laughs> it was, it was, yeah, be it was amazing. Yeah, and to be thriving and just <laughs> rocking it like you were. I mean, you are, are like one of Australia's biggest superstars. You oh, know? It's, it's thank you. <laughs> really incredible, and that that would have been a wonderful experience. Yeah, that era of you know, I, I pinch myself sometimes because we, you know, the the era we had in sport hasn't really been repeated since. 50, obviously, 56 is probably when we had that kind of mm. that dominance in, in the sport of swimming. And to have names such as, you know, Hackett and Thorpe and Liesville Jones and, 
and Susie O'Neill, Kieran Perkins, you know, the names yeah. just, you know, Levy Trickett, the names just keep going on. They're all Olympic champions, world record holders. And, you know, we're, we're all kind of uh, on the same sort of single-minded but like-minded people <laughs> with similar values. And, and, yeah, I think Australians in general, we sort of outperform ourselves in many senses and we're very resourceful and um, we're a force to be reckoned with and we're sort of we took that responsibility on as a team and um, yeah we held that mantle for quite some time now it's pretty common you would be well aware of it like for these young athletes that are at an, an elite level to uh Yes, be thriving through that, that peak period, through their 20s, maybe through their 30s. And then yeah. it's a pretty common situation for like after retirement yeah. or through injury or whatever, like yeah. the, 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 the downfall. Have you had that since post-retirement? Look, I've definitely had periods where I've had to reassess, mm. reassess my priorities, reassess lifestyle. Um, and it's... You know, it, it is. You know, people sometimes don't understand that. You know, as as an athlete of any from any discipline, you know, we've basically built our identity around that. And even to this day, if I walk down the street in Melbourne, people say, "Oh, there's Michael Klim, the sumo guy." Yeah. You know, I've always, maybe not always, but for a long time, I'll still be the sumo guy, even though I retired more than ten years ago. Mm-hmm. So I think sometimes that transition from building a new identity can be quite hard. And it's, you know, I was spending literally five, six, seven hours devoted everything to, for peak performance. Mm. And when you remove that from one's life, you have to replace it with something else. And replacing it with the same kind of purpose, with the same intent, mm-hmm. it's, it is tricky. And that's where, you know, un- unless you have... an a great support network, which I had from family and friends and management, etc. Um, and then have other passions, which obviously my business and then, um, you know, and then other things that I was really involved with. Uh, I think that, you know, to take away that void that was created from, from retirement. Yeah, it seems crucial. And I think the more we see just a, a lot of catastrophes, you know, in sport worldwide of these elite athletes just – peaking at you know 16 17 18 and then in their 20s if they don't have the support network or the tools to connect to who they are beyond their sport beyond their achievement Mm. it's kind of a recipe for disaster i mean we're seeing it again and again whether it's drugs or alcohol or depression anxiety It, it I mean, we see it in everything, not just sport, when people yeah. are heavily identified with being an actor, being a mm. lawyer, being a yeah. mother, being like being identified to that thing, yeah. and then that thing gets taken away. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a catastrophe a lot of the time. Yeah, huh? and then also there are these huge emotional highs, you know, through, right. I mean, obviously in, in say, in entertainment, even higher, you know, and and in sport too. I mean, the, you know, there's there aren't many feelings that can almost recreate that, that emotion of when you touch the wall, you turn around, you see a name, top of the list and you know either the either the wr flashing on the board or something like that it, those are those are really momentary kind of emotions but they are very high and a lot of the time it's you know people keep longing to wanting to re- replicate that which yeah. is almost impossible and i guess it makes sense why a lot of athletes would then turn to drugs because you get that serotonin boost that yeah. huge high but we can't stay high constantly, no, can we? No, <laughs> absolutely. No. So, look, it, I think we, a lot of the sport, the governing bodies are learning and right. um, they've implemented different programs. I know swimming have. Um, there's, a, uh, the, there's a bunch of state programs that are also national programs that is f- athlete career and education focused. So, um, you know, with, with resources from counselling, and um, it wasn't really accessible when I was when I was swimming, and also when I retired, I really had to seek that from a from a personal level because I realised that oh, I actually need some support. So now it's actually there's a program in place to assist athletes in not only towards the end of their career, but in that transition and, and life after sport. Yeah, yeah, good to hear. Yeah. Um, 
What do you feel is more challenging? Your, your swimming career and all your competing and all your training, parenting, <laughs> relationship, uh, <laughs> or business? So what's more difficult? What's more difficult? Oh, really, <laughs> really. <laughs> Look, they all have different, um, obviously, demands and different stresses. Uh, to me, swimming seems like it was probably the simplest of challenges <laughs> because it was so, um, you know, I was kind of in the driver's seat. I could control a lot of my dom- the, 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 the outcome. And um, even though I had, uh, you know, a lot of people working on my team, um, ultimately I was, in, you know, in the driver's seat. Um, I struggle in, in business sometimes where there are so many variables that, uncontrollable and even though you know I'd, <laughs> from swimming you know I liked controlling as many things as possible but still being adaptable you know business that that's the thing that is that I you know I, I struggle with um, parenting you know these <laughs> it's I think that's a completely different challenge you know because you're dealing with it with with an, an emotional, <laughs> on an emotional level. And it's, you know, with business, you can make some unemotional decisions. Whereas mm-hmm. when you start negotiating with kids that are 13 and are pretty switched on <laughs> and you're trying to not to get the emotion, emotions involved, <laughs> it becomes quite tricky. Um, and, uh, and then relationships, yeah, that's, and then put them all together. I think that's probably the hardest thing. To answer your question... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good summary, though. Yeah, uh, I don't re- I, yeah, I don't know. I think I think running a business can be hard from scratch. You know, I think there's it can affect all those. You know, can affect family, can affect relationships, mm-hmm. can affect your health. So, um, I think the you know the consequences of of a, of you know I, I was reading some stats even just last night. You know, there's. Uh, only 1.6% of businesses get to 10 years, which is <laughs> the percentage of that. It's almost similar 1. to 1.6. 1.6. Yeah, right. So it's you know it's almost the same percentage of winning a gold medal, almost you yeah. know. So uh, and then only and then the average time to get for a business to get to a million dollars is seven years. So mm-hmm. you know it's like a it's 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 a you have to devote yourself completely and. And the, the consequences of businesses failing are pretty high. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, no yeah. worries. <laughs> um, I bow to you. Got the, got the teenagers <laughs> rocking it at the green school. Uh, yeah. Are all three kids at the green school? Yeah, all three kids. Yeah, I've got Frankie, she's seven. Rocco is 10 and, and Stella's 13. Uh, and they're all, you know, they're all thriving. They've all got their different individual personalities yeah. and, and, and endeavors as well, which is kind of cool. None of them really into swimming at this point, but um, I'm pretty happy with them really devoting themselves into a certain pursuit. I think it's really important. I'd love to talk a little bit more about the Green School. Like I was touching on before, we're entertaining the possibility of bringing our daughters there, especially Soleil being the oldest one. Yeah. What, uh, like it's definitely a... Would you say an alternative way of schooling, of learning? I don't know a whole lot about it, but what I do know is that it's resonating so far. Yeah, good. absolutely. I think we, we, as you know, as parents, I think we're learning as well about the future of education, and I think we, you know, I think the green school is probably leading the way in designing their own curriculum, really. Um, and, you know, maybe putting focus on, on different things from creativity, personal development and sustainability, which is obviously it's a big, big area of focus for, for the planet. So I think it's, it's just an alternative way, as you say, of thinking, but also educating. So we, um, you know, we wanted to expose our kids to that. Um, if they will remain there all the way through to the end not sure but um i've seen massive changes especially my son for example where he had a speech impediment when he first got to green school and um really shy now he's probably a little bit overconfident at times but he's gone to narrating a a school play for example Mm. standing up on stage with his stutter that he still has and I mean, inherited from me, <laughs> but um, but he's got the enough confidence to you know to overcome some of these fears. So it's um, it's been really uh, really beneficial. Wonderful. Now, uh, 
back to your lifestyle. Yeah. Now, mm-hmm. you did mention you haven't had breakfast yet. You've had a couple of coffees. That, that's <laughs> a, a pretty common thing to do now, the kind of intermittent fasting. Yeah. How are you finding that? Look, I, I'm really new to, to that whole space. I haven't really um, – uh, I'm really just starting to dabble with, with some of these sort of fasting sort of regimes. As an athlete, I was really – I wasn't really um, – never really dieted. Um, it was more about timing of meals and making sure you're getting enough food throughout the day when you're exercising five, six hours a day. It's really important. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty open to I, – I've put on a little bit of weight. I got over 100 kilos, and um, that was a bit of a wake-up <laughs> wake call for me. And, right. and um, so I've got myself back to 95, and oh, I'm okay. working towards more – more fighting weight, which, you know, made me two or three more kilos. But it was more just I've got some friends in this health and wellness space and we're just sort of – I'm just playing around with a few different things. Well, yeah, like I said at the start, you're looking amazing. It's <laughs> super inspiring. <laughs> like they're still so locked into our kind of westernized conditioning. Like once you're a dad, you've got three kids yeah, and, yeah. you know, you get to 40 <laughs> and older, you, you just – you just naturally put on the weight and you naturally go downhill. So it's very <laughs> inspiring. Um, yeah. Just seeing people uh, doing it differently. You don't have to, having three kids doesn't mean you're a stressed out, uh, fat, uh, alcoholic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. And, you know, you have to, it's kind of that, you know, I've got a few friends that have taught me in a, in a way that sort of it's almost lifestyle by design, you know, mm-hmm. so you, de- <laughs> you kind of design, you see what that ultimate lifestyle looks like yeah. and then you try and design pieces around it and obviously you've done that very well, obviously travel's a big part in your life and same with me and how do you sort of fit exercise, how do you fit family life, relationships all around, mindfulness, look there's probably four things that I my lifestyle is based around um, one is still exercise I enjoy that it's more from a mindfulness point of view rather than just physical um, sleep I love I think sleep is so important and I love it and if I don't have it it's you know the, the I mean sleep deprivation is one of the, the, the main <laughs> things in torture that they use in the army so the effect of lack of sleep is huge diet uh, just eating clean really I don't um, except for at the moment when I'm playing around on a little bit of fasting and then some mindfulness practices so if it's yoga or meditation or going for a really leisurely swim um, those are four things that I just try and implement as much as I can beautiful what kind of yoga have you uh, delved into I've d- I, because I do a lot of f- intensive kind of gym training and some intensive swimming I tend to go towards the yin side of it where I need to actually slow down and I don't need to sort of uh, so I do enjoy some flow and where it's you know getting the sweat on but for me it's actually just getting getting with the breath and sort of slowing down and um because, yeah, I, I sort of get a bit uneasy after that one-hour mark, and it's, you know, pushing through. So it's, it's almost more of a challenge to be able to stand still. That's really smart. And I think for especially men listening and, like, muscular, competitive, uh, yeah. very strong and fit men, um, yeah. that yin component can mm. really uh, take their performance, take their strength, take their everything to, yeah. to new levels. Yeah. You know, we need that that feminine, that yin, that yeah. softening. Otherwise, the, the elastic band, so to speak, just snaps eventually. Yeah, you know? so absolutely. Really good to hear, and I think um, a lot of, uh, that will inspire a lot of people because yeah. there's a common resistance to that yeah. still yeah. in our culture, um, especially in places like Australia yeah, that's still pretty society, macho. Sure. And, um, yeah. <laughs> and we, tr- we try. We try and burn the candle from both ends, yeah. and most of us fail. Some people have a bit more resilience and yeah. can handle it for longer. Yeah. But undoubtedly, it's beneficial to yeah. soften and yeah. do nothing every now and then. Yeah. Like you said, the, the sleep. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's got to be a crucial part of why you just look so incredible and <laughs> your, your longevity. You I know? try and you know, like I go to bed pretty early. I, you know, I'm having a also, you know, the thing that um, look, this has all been a learning process for me, mm-hmm. um, and probably <laughs> some key learnings and um, that I've had and where I felt my body changing and mentally I wasn't really as pr- productive. 
Uh, my mood wasn't where I wanted it to be. I felt, you know, so I felt I was changing in so many areas. So, um, and I started becoming more involved in health and wellness in the health and wellness space through some retreats that I sort of helped facilitate here in Bali called Chosen Experiences. And that has been a little bit of an educational process how I can implement a lot of, you know, some of those that uh, you know key learnings into into my my lifestyle. But um, yeah, it's you know, it's not we can't be excellent at everything, but we can try and do our best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, talk a bit more about the retreats. They look incredible. You do them in great locations and yeah. a lot of goal setting. Yeah, and- yeah. So I, I mean, I've been involved with with the chosen experiences for coming up to four years now, and um, I sort of helped them facilitate the movement component here in Bali. Um, and obviously, there's a massive connection with me and water. So we do, uh, we do, uh, you know, we do a couple of water sessions, um, a couple of fitness sessions on the beach. But it's all through uh, cognitive experiences, through physical and just learning experiences, through trying different movements and exercises. And mindfulness is a big part of that. We do yoga every day um, just to finish the day off. There's some adventure stuff. There's um, taking yourself outside of that comfort zone. And there's a couple of workshops where we either facilitate a goal-setting experience or um, it can be tailored accordingly to the, um, to the group. But, um, yeah, I'm sort of the, uh, you know, the movement coach, I call it. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, describe, like, I've seen on Instagram that, like, the way you train – Mm-hmm. Um, do you bring that into the into the retreats? Because there's so many different styles of training now. A lot, yep. a lot of the kind of fat stuff is uh, kind of went from CrossFit to that kind of F45 thing, yep. and yep. Um, it seems like smart training, very yep. smart training, breaking it up and, yep. and very focused. You know, um, and look, with even with my training, it is it is always evolving and sometimes mm-hmm. I'll go through periods where, for example, I, I'm doing more bodybuilding type of exercises for a while, um, but I still then get back in the pool. I do a lot of mat work where it's um, just body weight exercises involving a lot of stretching. Um, you can do you can do a lot of great stuff with, <laughs> without any equipment whatsoever. Um, and that is a lot of the stuff that I do with Chosen, just to illustrate that you can be active while traveling um, with minimal equipment um, and yeah I think so it's but it's it's more about um, having structured exercise mm-hmm. incidental exercise as well and just being creative as well mm-hmm. now I I've heard from a few conversations back in your swimming days you were incredibly detailed with yeah. your record keeping and keeping track of your times like your your notebook collecting yeah, your yeah, writing yeah. was yeah, very yeah, yeah, yeah very precise and do you, do you feel that has continued into business life and goal setting and just staying staying focused i think it, initially it wasn't i um i i made a few mistakes um, because in business, in that was when I started making a lot of decisions on intuition and on gut, and um, I had this top line idea of starting this business, but really didn't understand the industry or the market. And um, I was very fortunate enough that people gave me the opportunity, then gave my brand a chance to um, to perform. But um, I, I certainly wasn't. So my knowledge where, when I was an athlete around my times, my heart rates, my resting heart rate, for example, my weight, my skin folds, all these different me- metrics that we used to record stroke counts and uh, you know, lactic acid in different, at different levels. So I used to you know, record all those and, um, and it was information or knowledge that would help me make a decision on different types of training or periodization or it's it's just knowledge right so um and i um yeah initially when i started the business i had no knowledge and i thought i could get by on just having a bit of (laughs) a good gut feeling about a, a decision and sometimes it can work but ultimately when you're taking your business from a six to seven to eight figure business you it's it's unfortunately it's not good enough to just to make a decision on, on intuition anymore. <laughs> yeah. So I've started. Yeah. Obviously, I 
very similar to it when I was swimming. I built a team of experts that are in different areas, so from sales to you know to obviously finance and different areas that people w- would specialize in that, from PR to digital, etc. Um, certainly not a not an expert in any of those areas, but I was able to build the team around that. Mm. It's a beautiful design. Uh, did you, you come up with the design? So the design, actually, I can put my hand up on that. I, yeah. I, I really, uh, I pride myself on, on on clean lines and sort of and some soft edges as well. And it was obviously the my surname being clean in, in reverse was milk, um, and it sort of I think it opened up. Uh, you know the the door for so many great sort of angles we initially obviously from a skincare point of view it's pure it's wide it's it's got a great connotation um but then unfortunately we learned that through the market and Australian men didn't really resonate with that all that well right. <laughs> it was probably too pure so we had to <laughs> we had to change the men's line to to Klim um and the the baby and the woman's remain oh, okay. milk but the design still is pretty minimal it's got to be simple um its efficacy is really important so um you know it's kind of delivering on that promise what you see on the bottle so um yeah so the design and and the branding part is something that I really enjoy mm. It is a, a funny trait of, especially Aussie men. Yeah. I don't know if it's that yeah. prevalent with, uh, do you need a... No, no, it's all good. <laughs> um, and uh, it's very thick with, uh, with Australian men. Um, yeah. That, the, the kind of macho resistance to any, any kind of self-care, especially skin care. So yeah. have you come across any other like, obstacles with um, the Australian male market with that? Well, it, to be honest, though, I mean, it's certainly there was... When I first started, and mm. you know, we've just ticked over ten years of our business, and uh, we launched in August of two thousand and eight. Um, and at that time, you know, men would still just only have soap. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, there'd be big percentage <laughs> of men that only use soap and occasionally steal products from their partners. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, you know, now we've seen, you know, we're at, say countries like say Korea, for example, and the men would have between six to eight different products in their bathroom. Our, our now average is between three and four. So we're increasing, but we're still a long way behind. But um, it's great to have retailers such as Chemist Warehouse, for example, that prove that a lot of men are looking after themselves. Uh, it's The split is 50-50, almost 50% men shopping in through those doors and 50% women. So um, it's, a, it's a great example that there has been a shift and a change. But uh, initially, it's been, it was quite tough. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, actually, upon reflecting on that, the pendulum has probably shifted quite a bit, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. There, there's quite a big movement. And then, look, there's that. been a trend, obviously, in fashion too. I think Australia's been, um, you know, there's obviously, a, even, especially in, in male, male fashion. So um, there's a lot of brands that have been competitive globally and, you know, even designed in Australia, they're doing quite well. So mm-hmm. um, I think we've been able to, and we've got a really good reputation from not only grooming, but fashion fashion and you know uh it's in, in that space so um i've been fortunate to to cop those rewards as well beautiful and a lot of the pro- uh, the ingredients in it are like sea uh, like algaes and stuff like that isn't yeah it? so the, the men's range that. was very much focused around water so obviously with my background um there was obviously great ingredients that come out of the ocean so algaes and seaweeds and sea salt and things like that but oh, um it's, it has also changed because I, I, I found out that guys don't necessarily always care about okay. the specific ingredients. They care about the effic- efficacy and they mm-hmm. care about what it's going to do at the, the result. So um, with our baby and women's offer, it's, you know, it's natural. It's all the uh, you know, ingredients, are some exotic ones, some local Australian ingredients. But with men, it was really kind of delivering on, on, that, uh, on that performance. Mm. Back on um, goal setting, and in particular, I'm thinking of young athletes that yeah. are really aspiring to rock it. They've, they're listening to you and going, yeah, well, I want to be in the Olympics or I want to be an AFL player or something like yeah. that. Have you got any wisdom or advice for those upcoming young women and men that yeah. are putting it all in, but they're mm. listening to this and like just listening to a lot of the common situations that happen of the, mm. the come downs and the, mm. all of that, some wisdom on 
goal setting mm. and like just going for it, mm. yet maybe uh, keeping keeping a level head on that that yeah. journey. Could you speak to that a little? Yeah. Bit? Look, I I don't know. I think it's I don't know if I can pass wisdom, but for me, it's more probably the learnings I've had through experience and the ones have been the most important. I think in sport we've seen so many people being able to come back and come back from adversity and the re- only reason they can come back is that they they persevere they don't give up you know and it's and i've um and it, unfortunately in sport well it's reality there's only such a small percentage of people that that get to the ultimate goal but um i think you know, I think perseverance is, is the key. So through injury, through disappointment, through setbacks or whatever it might be, I think being able to come back and come back the following day and taking, you know, someone said, actually it was Nicole Livingston who was a, a, one of my training mates. She said, I'll try and take something positive out of every single day. So you might you might have a really bad session but the fact that you st- you didn't give up, you pushed through the last couple efforts, you know, was was the tick. Um, and I think also being adaptable um, and being innovative. I think a lot of people get stuck in the, okay, this is the way I have to train, and you know, my body needs this, and are too scared to try new techniques or um, different you know, patterns or whatever it might be. So I think innovation as an athlete, we ha- mm. you have to innovate in time. <laughs> and I think, f- you know, so for a junior, I'd say be open-minded to trying different things and then just sticking at it because mm. um, you just never know when the tide will turn. If, yeah. yeah. And the goal-setting thing, like uh, visualizations and stuff like that have been quite popularized now. Yeah. Yeah. Are you a big fan on kind of visualizing that, that, that goal, that event, that situation? You're just creating that vivid vision? Yeah, so I think when, when we did visualization, it wasn't really visualizing the, the outcome or the feeling that you would have around the event. It was more about visualizing the process mm-hmm. because the um, for us in my event 48 seconds it happens so quickly and it's 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 almost we would visualize the actual race so I would go stroke for stroke and we would try and focus on key parts of the event for example that my breakout my first breath um, building into the wall then coming off the wall and uh, you know, getting into a rhythm. So it's more about visualizing ha- potentially how physically you'd feel and mm-hmm. some of those physical cues rather than visualizing emotions and things yeah. like that because uh, I think it's, and you know, and then it's funny when we were visualizing, we could get within a couple percent of the time, you know, from we would start the gun and then stop it when we'd, we'd visually mm-hmm. touch the wall and we were very close. So it's, uh, um, and that's another, just another method of training because we were, you know, one of the things I did after that disappointment 96 was to basically make that process automatic. So, you know, I did a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of miles, you know, let's say I do an average 50 to 60 kilometers a week. Um, I would do probably 100 to 150 races a year. Um, so that whole process of getting up on the block just comes. So it's almost the trigger is just the gun, and yeah. then you and then you're off and racing literally. Mm. And I think um, being too fixated on the outcome in anything, yeah, it can just bite us in the butt. Yeah, and time, it's huh? you know talking about the process mm-hmm. and you know with the right purpose. And I think you know it's. I think a lot of the, the, you know, we were actually debating in the gym last night, you know, about, you know, the importance of goal setting and, you know, having smart goals and, um, it, you know, like realistic goals and measurable goals. Mm-hmm. Or is it more, is the intent more important or is your purpose more important? You know, so uh, there is, yeah, I think that, that discussion with goal setting, it's kind of, um, it's changing a little bit. It's changing. And I think it, <laughs> there's a balance, like the, when you're flowing, when yeah. you're really flowing and hitting your goals and all that, like it feels like there's a balance between yeah. like yeah. being really focused, really affirmative, yeah. 
being really skillful at, at yeah. navigating like fear and doubt and just yeah. killing that shit. Yeah. And at the same time, kind of letting it go. Yeah. Yeah. And having, and then, yeah. Ha- having a bit of fun as well. Yeah. So that, you, and there's clarity, right? If you yeah. had the more clear you are, like where you're going and what you need to do. And it's like, it's almost like that's probably when you can get away from, you know, the detail and focus more on, mm. on, on the gut. But I think you still need a balance, like you said. Mm. And back to the sleep thing. I think sleep is a good indication if we don't have that down. I often suggest to people, like, even if you've had a shit day and you you haven't been in the zone, you've yeah. been stressed and just totally out of balance, like, kind of like brushing brushing your teeth and do, doing all that stuff and using your milk products. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, clear, clean up the mind. Like, getting yeah. do something, whether it's a swim or some yoga. Or, yeah. Like, at the very least, before bed, yeah. get the mind quiet. Like get your get your sleep down. Sleep is a great indication as yeah. to yeah. if we're in that clarity or yeah. Or, or, yeah. or not. Yeah, and then we can wake up fresh and, and try it again. Yeah, but you know, it's it's quite in, it's very interesting though. I think for everyday lifestyle and you know and longevity mm. and sustainability, sleep so important. But I've I've been on the um, I've witnessed that you we can actually perform so well without it. Right. <laughs> right, there's been occasions where I've gone to a major meet and I couldn't sleep. Yeah, you know, like uh, it was maybe two a.m., three a.m. I couldn't get to sleep. I had to be up in three or four yeah. hours and up for heat and. Um, and that's when you have to tell you tell yourself and tell your body yeah. that I'm gonna just just do it. I mean, I've got off got off the plane from you know flew from the US to Australia, you know jet lag, you know got off the plane and was lucky enough to break world records. So people yeah. think, you know, I, I think for sleep is so crucial for you know every everyday life. But when you need to, you know, step it up a notch and overcome a few things. Um, you know, you're capable of achieving some amazing things. Yeah, like short term. Yeah, that yeah, that adrenaline. Yeah. That that. Yeah, the body's amazing. The mind yeah. is amazing, and all that yeah. adrenaline. And yeah, I, I agree. I can think of a few times where I've been completely <laughs> sleep deprived, and kind of that delirium. Yeah. Can serve yeah. in, short, in a short term way. I mean, you do it for long enough, and you're fucked. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. The short term, <laughs> that delirium and that adrenaline. Yeah, yeah. it's powerful. Yeah. I mean, I've obviously you've probably you know read all about Ross Edgley's swim around the mm-hmm. UK, and you know, like he's obviously he's on that extreme end, but um, trying to sort of break out, open our minds as what is possible and what isn't, and um, but I think yeah, even he obviously goes back to a pretty <laughs> pretty reasonable, sustainable lifestyle after that. Yeah. What else has he done? He did like a. A marathon or a really long run, like uh, carry, like dragging a, a car. Dragging a car. <laughs> yeah, I love he what he's doing. Mount Everest, doing something crazy as well, <laughs> dragging something. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 a, it's, yeah. it's powerful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, back to your lifestyle. So, like, what are you doing right now? What's an optimum day of like nutrition for starters? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You said clean clean eating, yep. but I think uh, it'd be nice to miss that just a little bit uh, yeah, like yeah. What, what's a nice optimum day of eating for you um look uh, we we're very fortunate that i um, mean you know, i think that barley has some great produce yeah. so we you know i think obviously veggies and you know even last night we had a fresh snapper from jimbara and just down the road oh, so we prawns and snapper and i try and avoid starch kind of carbs when I, unless I'm really training heavy which I'm not really so um, but I realize how much I do enjoy them so I still have them occasionally uh-huh. but um, it's just having a good balance so yeah. you know I, it's funny that we kind of crave the things that are always not necessarily all that good for us but you know I still have things in you know in the morning generally I don't really probably eat till later in the morning and it's generally a snack or some fruit um throughout throughout the day uh, probably my most regular uh lunch would be a tuna sandwich um and then at dinner we you know i always i love a big bowl of veggies so Mm -hmm. um and then a big component is protein so even if it's chicken or, or or fresh fish throughout the day i don't really snack too much um probably coffee gets me through most of the days but fruit um love my apples and so those would you know i would supplement throughout the day mm-hmm. um 
And I've got a couple of supplements that I take, which are protein based, but you know, have you know, also with my, <laughs> I've had a few joint problems and muscle problems, so they just sort of with vitamin D and calcium, and just to help sort of mobility. And um, protein's a big building block for, especially you know, men our age where I'm a bit older, but like in getting our forties, fifties, uh, you know, trying to keep muscle mass is really important. Mm. Thank you for sharing. Um, I was just speaking to a dear friend who's a really expert nutritionist and naturopath and just really kind of on to the newest information. And he's all about the bivalves right now, so right. oysters and clams and mussels. <laughs> yeah, and right. Okay, just, well, it's uh, good to know that I'm <laughs> yeah, on the right track. On the right track, yeah. You might want to slide them in as well because uh, – the, the good thing about them is they're like loaded, like the most uh, like good fats like DHA yeah, and yeah, um, yeah. EPA, um, yet the lowest in like uh, heavy metals. Yeah, yeah. Because like a, a lot of the tuners and stuff yeah, like that yeah. apparently are loaded in heavy metals and the, these bivalves are low, more protein, more good fats, yeah. uh, next to no um, – heavy metal so yeah, yeah. i'm excited about that getting yeah. more bivalves in the diet well I, look to be honest i don't know like even i mean i, I never used to count macros or anything like mm-hmm. that is more yeah it's more just kind of knowing your body looking at it and feeling the difference yeah. so um yeah i think it's even when we when i was very analytical in my in in my sporting career probably food was more you really had to listen to your body, what you were craving, what you, you know, or the amount of training we were doing. So, mm-hmm. I think nutrition's become so much more scientific these days. Right. In 20, 20 years since I've, you know, obviously when I was in my prime, um, yeah, it's changed a lot. Mm-hmm. I know a few um, athletes that are overdoing the carbs and their iron, their irons way down. Yeah. Their um, their energy is way down. It's been quite. Uh, it's been a reoccurring issue for them. One, yeah. one guy in particular who's only 16 and he's doing really well with rowing, yeah, yeah. but uh, just addicted to the carbs, just yeah, won't right. eat anything <laughs> but the carbs, no matter what I say, no matter what these other uh, professional uh, nutritionists say, just yeah. hooked on the sugars, which yeah. I think is pretty common. Yeah, yeah. So I think even for the athletes that need a whole lot of carbs, yeah. I mean, those yeah. fats and proteins seem but pretty it's, crucial. But it's, huh? really, it's really interesting because, I mean, I think we were – we were told pretty much through the dietitian, the, all the dietitians at the IS, you know, carbohydrates were a big part of, you know, the everyday, you know, we'd have <laughs> pancakes and cereal for breakfast. And, Fun. you know, I didn't really have like a hot breakfast, eggs or, you know, if it was sausages or whatever it might be, or even, you know, even vegetables for brekkie, which, you know, now it's much more common. So um, it was yeah. so, you know, it's more focused around muffins and things that are like, <laughs> great. you know, but it's, I've even realized that, you know, I mean, now that I'm not expending that much energy, it, it does need to change. And um, But even looking at my son, he's, he's 10, and I've seen his cravings change. And, you know, he loves, he loves his dairy, and he's obviously growing, and he's just shot up, I reckon, nearly 10 centimeters in the last two months. And so he, you know, he, he'll devour cans of tuna <laughs> and things like that. So he's, he's physically growing. So maybe he's, you can see his cravings change, and he's obviously... It must be happening for a reason. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think we can actually take take the diet thing a bit too serious as well. So just listening to the body. Yeah. yeah. I look, I don't know. Maybe if I had the knowledge, I'd probably be yeah. a little bit more, <laughs> a bit more calculated. No, it seems to be working for you. Now, um, I mentioned to a couple of good friends that we were going to do this podcast today. And yeah. their response was like, oh, Michael, clear me a guitar. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I remember that. I mean, so vividly. That was... I mean that that relay was an epic moment, wasn't it? Yeah. Was that, was that a huge highlight for you of your career? Definitely, yeah. I think definitely from um, it was a highlight because it uh, it stood for so much more than just that one that race. You know, we were on the first day of the Olympic program. We're you know taking on the you know the the unbeaten the Goliath you know of, of swimming in America in America and um you know we had a team of kind of all <laughs> mixed match kind of swimmers where you know Thorpey was is only a 400 swimmer at the, at the time um Chris Fidler was a was a 
a veteran. It was his last competition. Ashley Callis was a rookie. And myself, I was the highest-ranked freestyler, ranked number four in the world. So on paper, we had no chance in taking on the Americans. But it just proves that, you know, Australia loves that under uh, the underdog kind of card and, and the role that we played. And we felt we had a responsibility to get the Aussie swim team off to a pretty good start. And um, we thought, oh, the only chance we could really sort of uh, – take it to the Americans was put them off their game. They love dominating from the word get-go. They were, um, I was lucky enough to break a world record in my lead-off leg and, and that sort of made the Americans over-race every single leg that they had um, with Thorpe's real sort of strong anchor leg that the last 20 metres, you know, he made up so much ground and, um, yeah, so the rest, the rest is history. But, um, yeah, you know, winning against all odds, it's, it's, it was pretty special. I don't think many people know about why you guys were doing the air guitar thing. So <laughs> who was giving you guys shit? He was like, uh, he was talking smack yeah, talk. Like, we're going to smash Hall, him Gary my Hall, guitars. Gary Hall Jr., he was, you know, it's actually, he's a friend of mine now. He's actually, he was always yeah. been very sportsman-like. He was great for the sport. He's a bit of an extrovert on on, on pool deck or around around the pool and when he arrived in Australia, he said, oh, I'm going to smash the Aussies like guitars. And, <laughs> um, and yeah, I think it, you know, we didn't really use it in motivation. We had enough motivation to get us going. But once, once we touched the wall and we knew the result, um, you know, we sort of had a, I can't remember if it was myself and Ian said, oh, let's, let's play an air guitar. <laughs> just, it, and it wasn't really to rub it in. It was more just to, I don't know, just a spontaneous <laughs> action and to this day you know people remember the the race for for the air guitar which is <laughs> which is kind of nice <laughs> it's a great memory and it was just such an extraordinary race uh, i can remember it very vividly yeah and look it, it was obviously um you know it, it was a great day of, of swimming with ian winning the 400 he almost missed uh, almost missed that race because he had a, a couple suit malfunctions and um, he came, you know, into the marching area really late. We were a bit thrown off our game, but you know we regrouped and um, and then looking up at that stand, you know, there were seventeen and a half thousand people in the temporary stand that was just shaking. And you know, I was lucky enough that being the first swimmer, I got to really experience that. The, you know, the the rest of two and a half minutes or whatever it went for, um, it was just just the noise was deafening, and then and obviously. Touching the wall first was uh, yeah, one of the m m most special moments of my career. Is actually walking back into the Olympic Village was after we've done our press conferences, our drug tests, um, we've saw our family. It was just the four of us, and walking back into the village with just our immediate support team, um, and then going into the dining hall, and and for everyone that was still there. You know, giving us a standing ovation amongst the peers was was really special. You know, like you know, people from different walks of life, different countries, different disciplines, and that was a pretty special moment. Mm. Beautiful. We've kind of yo-yoed from swimming yeah. to <laughs> lifestyle, but I think it's been a really nice balance of really showing um, how much you've rocked it, like in in so many different areas of your life. And oh, I think it's a you. real inspiration and really. Um, relatable accessible you're so humble even though Thank you're you. like i said one of australia's biggest superstars like <laughs> you're so humble and relatable and i think people from all walks of life can get a get a chunk of inspiration from this in whether it's serving their business ventures yeah. or just getting motivated in reaching for their dreams yeah. their goals and just so. going yeah. for it you yeah. know and yeah. taking those risks because yeah. um yeah, it's super motivating to see you having a beautiful family and a beautiful home and, and just running your business beautifully. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And, and look, I think, you know, and for, I hope that, you know, I've learned through, you know, I'm 41 now and it's, I've had, you know, transitions in my life from obviously initially, uh, obviously very career driven in the pool and then family focused and career again and so there's mm -hmm. we go through different phases in in our life and um you know i feel like i'm in my second third <laughs> at the moment and um uh, you know i think it's it's all about just you know making you know new decisions and you know taking what we've learned and applying that and i think there's no 
And yeah, there will be tough times. There's certainly, you know, I've, I've experienced them on different levels. Uh, but uh, it's similar to that advice that I gave to the sporting youngsters. It's more about just, you know, coming back and trying to do things better the next day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think um, people can often have the image of someone such as yourself and, and put it on a pedestal, yeah. un- understandably, but to unrealistically put it on a pedestal and just look at the... Look at the highest. Look yeah. at the medals. Look yeah, at the absolutely. beautiful business. And, yeah, and they look, you know, they look at Instagram feeds yes. and they look at social media and they, you know, obviously people don't post things that are either uncomfortable or the down times or, you know, the stressful periods. Mm-hmm. It's, um, yeah. So I think it's 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 normal. We all experience them, and um, and it's showing a bit of um you know i've i've shown vulnerability in in the recent years and reached out for help and it's and it's especially mental health has been such a big topic that you know we've learned so much about in the recent years and i've you know sadly i've i've been touched by it on a personal level f- with with friends and um and it's yeah something that i you know i think we're I think it's, yeah, we're all learning about and we're moving in the right direction, so. Yeah, I think so too. It's like, it seems like um, this whole social media thing, evidently it is amplifying a lot of these mental issues. Yeah, it's a, it's yeah. It's a really weird time with the social media thing. Yeah, and exactly. Especially for the young kids, like, uh, can get so sucked into it mm. and mistake their identity for that as well and this yeah. weird cocktail of the dopamine hit when you yeah, yeah. when you get good shit going on with yeah. your social media but then a lot of the more negative stuff that's going on with it as well yeah so uh, it, it is an interesting time where of these mental uh issues where mm. again the, the kind of identity thing yeah. whether whether it's yeah. I- identifying with being an athlete or now everyone's identi- and identified with their social media image yeah which exactly is yeah. really tricky to navigate and they compare themselves to to other accounts you know to probably to and it's not really a you know it's it's almost an avatar of another mm-hmm. person you know? it totally is but i think a lot of studies are showing that a lot of these, a lot of people, but especially the younger kids coming up, are more, Id- yeah, more identified with the avatar yeah, yeah. than they are with themselves. And, yeah. uh, it could just be part of our evolution, which it obviously is, but yeah, it's very yeah. interesting to see where it goes. Yeah. And, um, Look, I've had to, and from a, from a personal point of view, like, you know, obviously my, my oldest daughter is, um, is kind of pretty exposed to it through... Um, you know, her, in her circle of friends, they all have accounts and you know sharing stories, etc. But um, it's it's quite interesting to see what you know my daughter values is in what she wants the other people to see. Right? You know, she's got great talents from the horse riding, the surfing, and swimming, and creativity. And um, but some of the things that she thinks are of value are not necessarily in line with that. So um, and it's just I think it's you know, probably our responsibility to guide them or educate them in a sense that um, if there was a way of showing people what you are as a complete person, yeah. that would be, you know, that's probably more valuable than anything. <laughs> yeah, having a five year old daughter, we uh, just kind of marvel at what's, what's ahead. You yeah. know? Like even another. <laughs> another five, six, seven years or whenever she yeah. starts to get onto the social media thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. What's it going to be then, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who knows? That's the thing. We don't know. We don't I mean, know. It's come so quick and it's evolved so quickly. So um, I'm kind of not smart enough to read the trends. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, lo- I love the way you're doing it. It's very inspiring and tasteful and, and, and real, you know. It's yeah. really... Um, Sometimes it's candid, and, but mainly it's inspiring. It's, yeah, it's really you. cool. So I think you're doing it in a really balanced a way. <laughs> but Michael, it's been a real honor chatting you. with you no, and spending time it. with you. You're such an inspiration. Mm-hmm. Are there any upcoming retreats or anything like that that you want to share with people? Well, yeah, Chosen, Chosen has a bunch of uh, retreats on, on their website. We've got a, a bunch of ones coming up in Bali. Uh, Iceland is it's a new location in South Africa as well if people wanted to experience something different. 
But um, if you want to come and hang out with me in Bali, there's uh, there's a couple of dates later on in the year. So uh, head to chosenexperiences.com. Um, but otherwise, just follow my account, and uh, I'll send, I'll share some uh, share some info with you guys on that as well. Great, and the website to milk. Yeah, cream. so milk and milk and co. dot com. dot au. Um, you can get all our men's, women's, and baby products. Um, we, you know, we we ship worldwide, but also available in bricks and mortar in thirteen different countries. But uh, yeah, it's uh, I'm sure we can cater for any anybody out there. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much. Chatting. Thanks, Chip.